Trigger Warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. Archie, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Finally, you're here, finally. I know, it's <laughs> finally here, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you and you're one of, I'm not blowing smoke, you're one of the most uh, uplifting and encouraging people to talk to and I always feel a little bit energized after we talk. So <laughs> uh, I just want people that are listening to know uh, if you need a friend, Archie is the man, he's, he's awesome. Oh, thanks man. That's not a question, but I like to leave a good awkward silence after I make a statement <laughs> like that. So, uh, but yeah, uh, tell us first a little bit about you. I want to talk about what you do now, but I want to go back mm-hmm. to the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, you grew up gay in the Southern Baptist Convention. Was that as mm-hmm. fun as it sounds? Or was there any <laughs> downsides to that? <laughs> wow, uh, that's a perfect way to frame that question. Um, yeah, there wasn't really anything fun about it. Um, you're correct. I, I am a gay. And I did grow up in the South. I grew up in Alabama and I grew up in the church. And um, uh, what, what's really interesting, and I know that you and I have talked about this in our personal life before, uh, just as friends, the church was such a welcoming place for me mm-hmm. until it wasn't. Yeah. And the it wasn't part, um, which is, you know, later down the story was what um, hurt so bad and mm-hmm. what took a lot of therapy to work through. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a great time in youth group. I loved youth group. I loved, I loved all the, the, the fun aspects of church, but then the part that was not so great was, you know, once a month, at least, uh, being told that you're going to go to hell for mm-hmm. something that, you know, is inside, but you know, you can't talk about it because it's the thing that's going to send you to hell. Yeah. Um, which, um, just to start the episode off with a bang, that is trauma. That is trauma. There's no other word to put on that than that. That is a trauma experience in my life and in many members of the LGBT community um, to just constantly be told we're going to hell. So yeah. that part was not fun. Yeah, man. I, I've I've never talked about this on the on the show before, uh, ever. But it's something that that's come up a lot, and and it's one of the it's one of the first things that really pushed me outside of. I would say whatever you want to call, I hate labels, but outside of evangelical subculture was just the way the LGBT communities talked about. And um, I've talked about this a little bit with a couple of different people, but there were two issues. It was that, and it was um, the Islamophobia stuff, you know, that, 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 those two things in tandem really just, I couldn't reconcile that. I just Mm -hmm. couldn't, I couldn't put those two things incompatible with the faith that I was experiencing. And it is, it, it, you know, I would listen to people, you know, within the church talk about being concerned a a child is gay or a family member is, and they would talk about it as if, you know, they had terminal cancer or something, or they were dead or they, and it was like, I just sat there was like, okay, so if they are, they're still your daughter or they're still your son, Mm -hmm. or they're still Mm -hmm. your cousin. And I just never, I could never grasp how there's so much fear and vitriol and anger. And I can't imagine being in, you know, Alabama in a, in a, you know, small church dealing Mm -hmm. with that stigma. And uh, when did that kind of come to a head? Because, you know, you're, you're in there. It is the most welcoming place that hits me Mm -hmm. like a knife through the heart. It's the most welcoming place in the world till it's not. When did it shift to it's not, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, so I was one of those kids, uh, I'm going to answer your question, but let me give you a little context. Um, I was one of those kids who was always at church. I know you and I share that, that, yeah. that, yeah. I mean, like if the door was open, I was there more um, than home at church. Oh but, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Like I never went to a party with alcohol in, in high school ever <laughs> No, um, same. Yeah. because, <laughs> because my parents were like, oh, he's always at church. And I really was always at the church um, after band practice. I would go to church on Wednesday yeah. nights. I would go to church. Um, and we did, um, I was lucky in that my Southern Baptist church um, was 
it's not um um uh was not so fundamental that like we're not going to do musicals like youth musicals were a huge thing in our church mm -hmm. um and honey, let me tell you, I can choreograph the shit out of a youth musical. And I mean, like I was doing like costume changes and props and, and I don't know how people didn't know I was gay, but like, like giving you full on Broadway um, at this musical. And so like the church was such a huge part of my life that um, I think when I was a junior, we had this group called Life Action Ministries. Um, they're like a touring group and they came mm -hmm. to our church and they were there for this big revival. Um, and it was at that point that I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this thing forever. Um, and so I ended up going to school at a Southern Baptist university because I was going to become a minister. I mean, I actually am a licensed minister in the Southern Baptist church, um, and, um, have done a few weddings, um, you know, not anymore, but back in the day. Uh, and it was when I was at school. Uh, and I was working, um, well, volunteering, because, you know, it's all volunteer for most people, um, volunteering at the at the youth in the youth ministry um, at this really big church in our town. And, um, you know, you can only keep up, well, I believe, but for my, my experience, you can only keep up um, the appearance that you're not gay for so long. And um, once I graduated from from school, um, I did go to a gay club. There was one gay club in our town. And so I went because um, I knew that I was gay, even though I was going to get married to this girl. Um, like I was still like living in this life of like going to marry a woman. And I guess the word spread a little bit. And I went to church um, where I was volunteering. And um, the youth minister uh, at the time um, said, hey, we need to talk. Um, and the conversation really went just about like this. Hey, so it's come to our attention. There's this rumor um, that, that you're gay. I don't need to know if it's true or not, but you just can't be here. And I was just like, okay. And so I didn't deny it. I didn't say anything. I just left. And so that was the like beginning of the rift with, uh, the, with organized religion, um, specifically Southern Baptist. Uh, I went to New York I was doing my thing. And every time I would come back home, I would go to my home church and sing because I'm a singer, right? Until um, one year I was getting ready to go home from church and I was, um, uh, it was, it was, it, my mother passed along the information that I, the pastor would prefer I not come to church when I come home. Um, and so then that was just kind of it. I was like, this is just bullshit. Yeah, that, that that to me is the worst thing about it. I mean, well, I mean, worst <laughs> in the context of this show, worst <laughs> takes on a lot of new meanings. But, you know, for me, you know, obviously we have a different story, but I think similar experiences and how the separation happened. And for me, that's the worst thing is that everything is always done in a way where and I'm sure many listening can attest to this kind of experience, but a lot of times in the church, you're not explicitly told you're not welcome here. That's very rare. That conversation happens. It certainly does. Typically it's, we would prefer if, or we'd be more comfortable if, or, or yes. so-and-so the pastor told so-and-so to tell you, tell you. this. Yep. And so no matter how peacefully you separate, there's this feeling of like, well, we didn't do anything. You chose not to come back. And it's like, no, you told me you'd prefer me not be <laughs> within the parameters yeah. of this, you know, this building. That's a really hard thing to deal with because you don't get closure of, oh, they were a jerk and they cut me off. It's just yeah. a lot of unspoken stuff. So how did you kind of grapple with that? You know, the place was a home. It was a place where you spent all your time. It feels like losing family. Like, how do you deal with that kind of, that kind of yeah. situation? No, I mean, it, it, it was, it was like losing a family in many ways. Um, and, you know, to jump into a, a different part of my story, um, like I, I, I say to people all the time, like, no wonder I became a drug addict, like no wonder, um, because the very first time that I did drugs, it made all the hurt go away. Yeah. Um, it made all the, the pain, all the not being welcome, all the not being good enough. I mean, there was so much wrapped up in this. I'm also adopted. So there was this like mm -hmm. um, separation stuff from the beginning of, of, you know, no matter how many times. Um, and I was adopted later in life. I have a, I have a child and um, he's adopted, but he was adopted at birth. There will still be some conversations mm -hmm. with our son, but not to the extent when you adopt someone with their two. Like now that I have a child, I know how much goes on between zero and two. Mm -hmm. 
And so it doesn't matter how many times you're told you're loved or we chose you or like you're special because it doesn't matter. You still, there's still all this stuff that's missing. And so like, I literally had the perfect ingredients to become a raging drug addict. And so when I tried drugs and it made all of those things go away, um, it just it just ramped up in an extremely fast way. I mean, I, I went from like using drugs off of a pin top to like using drugs intravenously mm. um, in like less than a year. Um, that's a that's a really fast spiral, uh, and it, it it and so much of it was because of this this piece that was just. I mean, if you're if you're just constantly told you're going to go to hell. And you're constantly constantly told that like of all the things of all the things I don't know why the church but specifically Southern Baptist have just like latched onto this gay thing like I'm not sure how we get over like the affairs and the divorces and the touching of pigskin and like we just we just we're gonna pick this one thing like what's the point so what's the what's the point you know yeah yeah well I I mean I think touching on that, I think one of the reasons is that it's not something that hits close to home for many of the pastors within, I mean, there's two trains of thought on this. One is that it doesn't hit close to home um, in that, you know, it's just a distraction from legitimate issues. Like you won't hear Mm -hmm. the joke in the independent Baptist world is you don't hear pastors preach about gluttony, you know, but they'll preach on abortion because they've never had to have one, Um, you know, but then you go (laughs) into the other side of that, which is like, maybe it does hit close to close to home mm-hmm. for some and they're repressing as well. So there's, there's a lot yep. of different views on that. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious before we move forward, yep. you mentioned family was your, was your actual family, you know, your adopted family, did they react the same way and did they separate themselves as well? Or was it something where they consistently tried to, you know, step in and, and love you, even though their church wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it's been an evolution. Um, you know, I think in the beginning, uh, it was really tough for my parents. Um, and I, I mean, I, I get it, you know, they mm-hmm. were in the deep South, um, at a time when, um, you know, uh, it wasn't okay to be gay. Uh, and I mean, they, I mean, I'll say this, they kept going to church there. Um, yeah. but they also mom at least said that she made it very clear to the pastor that, like, this is our son, we're, I'm going to keep loving him, like, so just back off. So, you know, at least there was that put up. Um, You know, I, I I mean, I don't know when this is going to air. But like, in real time, my mom is on the way today to to be here, because we're not going anywhere for Christmas. We've had so much happen in our Mm -hmm. life that we're just like, I told everyone, we're not coming anywhere. (laughs) And so she's coming so that she can see Kate, our son. Um, And so, I mean, they, they love us and they love our child. I don't really care anymore if they agree or support. Like I've stopped going to the hardware store to buy apples because the hardware store does not sell apples. So I'm going to stop going and like even being concerned if they think this is a choice or if they're good with my lifestyle. I don't give two shits anymore. Like if they want to love their grandchild, then they're going to see me and my husband sleeping in the same bed. If they don't want to do that, then th- th- that's fine. Like that's, that's really where I am in my life. But that took, a, that's a very evolved time. Like that took yeah. a long time. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I guess that they, um, I mean, they didn't, you know, they didn't like put up a fight and say, Oh no, he's going to come. Not that I would have gone anyway, but at least she did say this is our son. So, you know, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, this is one of those funny things like where I, again, you know, especially the last couple of years that start thinking about it. I'm just like, when it comes to the conversation, because obviously the, the, the running in circles, you know, within, within this world is always, you know, um, it's the Billy Graham, you know, love the sinner, or hate the sin or, or whatever oh, those, Lord. you know, I, I know I don't want to get you started on, on that. Rabbit hole, but the, the, <laughs> There's a, I got to a point, you know, people would ask me, you know, you know, well, do you, what do you think about it? Or what's your opinion? I was like, my, you know, or are you for that? Whatever. And I was just like, I am not for it for me. (laughs) And I'm the, the only person who I'm concerned who I'm sleeping with is myself. You know what I mean? So it's, (laughs) it's, to me, it was just a very weird thing. And again, it was like, I was like, why are you so concerned? I I, like, why, why so fixated on what someone else is doing that has nothing to do? Like, I don't, I get around guys that, you know, 
<laughs> whatever, sleep around with a bunch of different women or they do this. And I'm just like, that doesn't even come into my field of yep. vision when thinking about them as a person. It's, it's a very weird church, just churchy way of viewing it. Um, but yep. back, to, back to kind of coping with it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you said drugs were kind of a great mm-hmm. way to ease that um, those feelings of, and, and they were a comfort. Um, when did you realize it was a problem? Because it <laughs> seems like a solution in the beginning. When did you realize like, yeah. this isn't good. This is not a solution. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I do want to say like, if there's someone that's listening, that's struggling, you know, with addiction, I don't want this to be a trigger. So if you need to like pause for a second, I just want to don't on that. But um, yeah, so uh, my drug of choice was crystal meth. Um, like I couldn't just choose like a simple one. Like I had to ch- choose one that like go all the way out there and like get the hard drugs. Um, but I, I literally did go from like snorting it to smoking it very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that was a huge leap for me because in my mind, um, like in, in the beginning, like shooting up was never even an option. That wasn't even something I would even consider, but like moving to the point where you're smoking drugs out of a pipe, that's like a hardcore drug addict. And in my mind, at least, but I, I guess from the time that I started sniffing it until the time that I snorted, I mean, I started smoking it was maybe, maybe three months. Wow. And, and then the real life, the first time I ever smoked crystal meth, I remember thinking this could be a problem. Like I remember thinking that because that you're just elevating the high, you're elevating what it does to your body. Um, and then, you know, the first time I ever tried it intravenously, I was with a doctor. And so in my mind, I was like, I mean, you know, if you're going to try it, you should try it with a doctor that like knows what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, then after that, it was just like off to the races. And then it was a, it, it, it was a problem from that point on. Sure. Sure. And how long did this go on? Uh, I mean, I struggled, um, with trying to stay sober for, I mean, a decade. I mean, it was a, it was a very long time, um, to try to, and there were, um, there were periods of sobriety. Um, you know, there were, um, I, I was still living in New York city at this point. Um, and I'd stopped performing because performing really isn't an option when you're high all the time. Like, so I got fired, um, from a show that I was in or, or released, I was released. Um, from a show that I was They'd in. They prefer if you don't come back. <laughs> like ever come <laughs> back. Like, please don't ever come back. Um, and, uh, and, but then of course, like at the time, at that point, I was just using it like a, as a victim mindset. Well, look what they did to me. <laughs> well, dumbasses, because you're high all the time. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I bounced around 12 step programs uh, until I finally met this guy um, who really ended up saving my life. Um, he was my first like legit sponsor. Again, if you're listening, find your own path for me. I found mine through a 12 step program. I don't endorse it, but it worked for me. Um, and, uh, I just fought for my life and I managed to get, um, you know, after over like a three year period, I finally managed to put a year together. Um, uh, but then I still just kept stumbling like this, uh, this, the drug just had like such a, um, insidious, uh, hold on me. And it really wasn't until later in life. So I, I went to two inpatient rehabs, one, when I was just like in New York, just a mess, like I was going to die. So they sent me off to rehab and then one much later in life, um, because I decided to introduce alcohol back into my life because alcohol wasn't my problem. So like, I'll just try this, uh, and went again. And it wasn't until that inpatient stay when I finally started talking about the fact that I hear voices in my head, Mm -hmm. when I finally got honest about the fact that I once tried to take my own life, when I finally said those things and my, my therapist was like, okay, cool. And that was it. And then I was like, wait a minute, can we stop just a second? Like, I was like, I'm telling you these huge things. She's like, well, get you some medicine. We're going to talk about this. Let's just keep moving. Um, that's when I finally began to get better. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And if people haven't gotten this already, you know, you're very open talking about your experiences and mental health, especially like that's mm. very much your brand. Anybody that <laughs> Googles your name right now, that's going to yep. pop up. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's really powerful that you talk openly about this because look, we can look at addiction. We can look at Mm -hmm. a a billion other problems and they are all rooted in Mm -hmm. mental health. I would say Mm -hmm. 99% of problems are rooted in some kind of mental health Mm -hmm. issue, you know, and, 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 you know, people tend to think of that as something, especially evangelical world. Like I always thought like 
yeah, people have mental health issues. They need to come to the church, you know? And then, <laughs> and then you start realizing like, oh, like we probably all have something that we need to mm-hmm. address and look at. Um, you know, once you realized that, okay, addiction is a problem, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not the root. The root mm-hmm. is, is mm-hmm. mental health. Yep. How did you start tackling that? And, and, you know, what was that process kind of healing and understanding and kind of rebuilding with that knowledge in mind? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's also a great time to point out that, you know, if you're listening and maybe you, um, you know, don't have a lot of experience with addiction or haven't listened to a lot of, you know, episodes, people talk about it. Like, I firmly believe that drugs were not the problem. Drugs were a symptom of the problem. The problem to your question was much deeper than that, but that was some painful shit to be digging back in. And by this point, then it had all the drugs on top of it and all the dumb stuff you do when you're high to kind of get down to that point or the, go ahead. Well, I was was just going to say, would you say it's easier to address those surface level issues like drugs or alcohol? (laughs) Because, because I I see people go into AA, Mm -hmm. you know, and their personality doesn't change. They Mm -hmm. just get rid of this crutch and move to something else. Um, you know, why do, why do you think we struggle to go deeper into that? Yeah. Because it hurts. Yeah. It hurts. And, and we have to look at our own part in it. Um, like at the end of the day, I put the needles in my arm at the end of the day, I did, I did the things right. So like you, you can, yes. Was I high? Yes. Is that an excuse for everything in life? No. Just like when you're in therapy, every excuse cannot be my parents. Like it can't be. Or you're never going to, in my opinion, in my opinion, you're never going to get better. So sure, is it, is it manageable? Not easy. Is it manageable to not do drugs or not, not do out, drink alcohol for a couple of months? Yes. Is anything really going to change unless you fix the part inside that you're hiding? No, it's not. And I am living proof of that, of that, of that, of that, that truth. Um, so, you know, we all have, I think this is, I don't, I don't think I have to say my opinion. We all have these things, these, these moments, these, these experiences in our life that are, um, they are life course shaping. They, they, they form who we are. They form our opinions about things. They form our beliefs about things. If we want to do like an in and out, um, analogy from Disney, there are core memories, like there are these core pieces of who we are. And for a lot of us that have trauma in our life, those core memories are not like fuzzy warm ones, but we keep them pushed down really far inside. Um, And what I found, um, I think you and I've talked about this, what I found fascinating during, in a, in a sad way, but fascinating during the pandemic was that we as human beings are pretty good about keeping, like keeping stuff pushed down. But that's the simple stuff, right? So then when then all this fear and uncertainty and like confusion from the pandemic, like we couldn't keep our feelings pushed down because it was so much just coming up and coming out. And so for a lot of us, those places inside almost got exposed. So Mm -hmm. we're like, how much more can I eat? How much more can I drink? How much more can I run to like keep these things pushed down? That's exhausting. And to your point, that's the work that I do today is helping people understand that these things that are inside this, this shit that we're piling money and clothes and sex and porn and drugs and alcohol. What'd you say? And DoorDash. And DoorDash. Okay. Yeah. DoorDash. DoorDash. Lots of DoorDash. Like we're just pouring in on top of it. Yeah. It's not just going to get better. Yeah. um, Unless we do something with it. And so for me, I finally had to be okay talking about those things that I, I never thought I would say, I never thought I would say the words, I hear voices in my head. Like I hear people up there that I, you know, I sometimes talk back to, like, I never thought I would say that ever because you're going to put me back in the, in the mental institution. Like, I don't want to go back to a psychiatric ward, but like when I finally started talking about the shit and like that opened the floodgate for talking about all the stuff and then it just all like kind of came, but then I had this huge gaping wound because this wound had been there forever. And let me also say that that pain and that wound that served me in some way. You know why it served me? Because it allowed me to keep doing drugs. It allowed me to keep being the victim. Like this, 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 this wound inside, this stuff that we hold inside, it serves us. It serves us in some way or another. And for me to finally own that, like, yeah, 
yeah, I just am constantly making excuses as to why I can't get sober. So am I just going to stick this fucking needle in my arm? Am I going to talk about this shit? And yeah. then finally I decided to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that, that conversation keeps circling around, you know, lately. And, and there's this idea of, you know, you don't, you don't want to be a, a victim. Um, and there's two extremes of this. One is get over it. It's not a big deal, which is not helpful to anybody. Not helpful. Um, you know, the other version of this is, you know, at a certain point, you know, you can't keep giving power to the trauma, you know? So when you're talking with abuse, when you're talking yep. experience with family, with church, yep. you know, you can't keep saying, you know, because of this thing, I am what I am because you're still giving all the control to that thing. And, and people don't realize that people don't realize that when you're saying they're saying my parents, my parents, my parents, you know, forever. And, and you can, again, you can accept and say, because my parents were messed up, I struggle more with mm-hmm. this thing, or I struggle sure. with anger because I saw my dad punching holes through walls, you know, like that happens. That's real biology and the way our minds work. Yep. But you have to be able to also say, my parents did this. Now I need to look at me. What am I doing? Yeah. How can yeah. I break the cycle? And I think that's where the conversation gets lost because there's unhelpful dialogue on both sides. There really Absolutely. is, there really is the well, be a victim, you're damaged and just take this medication and do this for the rest of your life and you're stuck or get over. It wasn't a big deal. It's like, no, it was. And so there's this middle ground here. And I think you do a good job of really staying there and saying, okay, what happened was bad. We accept that. What are we going to do now to break that cycle? Yeah. And then, and then continue to do the work right. to not let it go because it's, it's really easy for me to slip back there. You know, it's really easy for me to, um, you know, when people, when people hurt my feelings, um, which they do. Um, it's really, well, that's okay. People do things. I allow my feelings to get hurt if we want to get really honest there, but like um, <laughs> it, it, it um, it's easy to slip back into that mode um, because it serves us. And I don't people listening to this to be like, God, this guy's a bitch. Well, I mean, sometimes I am, but like what I'm, act, what I'm, what I'm saying is very true that like all these feelings that we sit in, all these lived experiences that we sit in, all these um, beliefs that we sit in, we sit in them because they serve us in some way. And I'm not saying that mm-hmm. in like a, in like a malicious way. Um, sometimes that sometimes our beliefs actually keep us safe. Right. So there's, there's a, there's, there are reasons and there, there are reasons to hold our beliefs, but I do think it's important. And it is it important for my journey as well, it's particularly to look at like, what is this belief doing for me? What mm-hmm. is this, what is giving to your point? What is giving this memory power? What is that doing for me? Yeah. And if it's not doing anything to help me uh, in my emotional wellness journey, then why am I hanging on to it? And why, why do I continue to give it power? And for me, the only way to begin to do that is to begin to talk through with a professional, to begin to think about like, okay, why have I given this memory this much power? I'm not doing that anymore. And then reassigning kind of what happened, own what happened, change, change the change that I can change how I feel about that memory and then move to a different state. You know, I, I wasn't zoning out or daydreaming while you were talking, but I was thinking about what, what you were saying, because I think it is it is interesting, the things we fall back into. And, um, you know, the the book, When the Bike Keeps the Score, I've mentioned a million times in the show mm-hmm. because it's it's kind of the go to <laughs> reference for how this stuff affects your your mind and your your body. And, you know, we all have these things we fall back into, these feelings that we fall into. And, and for me, you know, I was thinking while you were talking, like I constantly fall into feeling extremely lonely. Like that's where I fall all the time, you know? And, and, um, and I say this like last night I was, uh, you know, I mean, I was laying in bed feeling just super alone, which is so weird. Cause like two inches next to me was my wife. And, uh, but I felt extremely alone, extremely depressed and just, just down. And I, I go through that. And, And a lot of it comes from, I've lost a lot of relationships, in yeah. the church. I lost a lot in the last month. I lost many good friends just in the last, you know, in November. Um, and I, I felt myself in that spiral of just, oh my God, you know, like, um, and I've, I've said it before, not to make this totally a downer, you know, episode, but I've, I've talked to, uh, like we can go keep going down and deeper and deeper. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, I've told my wife many times, like I think about a lot, you know, oh, at my funeral, will there be people there? And I, and I know that's a super silly thing to think about, but I think mm-hmm. about that constantly. And I, I thought about that again, just this last month, 
Mm. And it's, you know, for me, I think about impact. I think about, you know, what am I, am I leaving some kind of mark on the world in a positive way? And this last month when everybody kind of, you know, I was, I saw bridges just start burning, uh, burning up. I was like, okay, my list of people that are going to remember me got smaller, you know, and it's a, it's a very, when you were talking, I was just sitting there going like, I don't know how that serves me aside from, you know, I, I think I've given myself a lot of reason to pull back from a lot of people because I'm tired of getting hurt. So like for, for me, it's when, when I think of when the body keeps the score, that, that idea of your body sending triggers of warning when there's no danger, I see, I feel that all the time when I'm around people who are, you know, extending help or saying, Hey, you can hit me up if you feel like that or whatever, after this episode drops, I'll get messages from people that'll say, Hey, if you ever need anything, you don't have to feel like that R- warning signs. I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm not into this. <laughs> like, let's not do this, but it, it is, we all have that thing we slip into. And for me, that's been a constant cycle. No matter how healthy I get, I resonate so hard with, it's easy to slip right back into that. I could be at a high and then drop to that low in a few minutes. It's, it's mm-hmm. super easy still. But yes, and I I do as well. Um, I I do just I know <laughs> I know this isn't like a this is a recording, not a conversation. But I just want to stop and just make sure you know the impact you're having, how loved you are. Um, you're one of those people that I actually worry about because you are carrying, in my opinion, you're carrying such a huge a huge burden, and you're doing such difficult work, and yet you stay in it. Um, and so I I check on you frequently and yeah. read comments. Um, so just just know the impact you're having on the world, um, regardless of how many people show up when they're putting like dirt in the ground. Um, like you are, you are making an enormous impact. And I'm grateful that you're out there doing it. Um, partly because I don't want to do it. Um, but secondly, because you do it with such so much more grace than any of the rest of us would because I just would be like screaming at this point. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I also switch back into that. And so my my point to, to bring it back to the conversation is that the beauty in both of us is that we acknowledge that it's happening. Like I acknowledge that it's happening. Mm -hmm. There is power even there. Um, And you know, the, the, you know, I I really do try very hard to put out things into the universe that are going to be helpful for people. Mm -hmm. And then every now and then I'll get this like catty comment and it will spin my world into a different universe. Cause I'm like, wait a minute, that's what they took from that? When I'm literally trying to help people? Like the other night, I was literally like just spinning, spinning, but I knew that I was doing it. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna spin for a second. And my husband was like, all right. Uh, but like I spun for a second and then I got myself out of it because I, I knew what I was doing. So, um, you know, you know this, but there is there is growth and there is power in just the fact that you're acknowledging it. Yeah, yeah. that, And I'm glad you connected the dot because uh, I went on my tangent. I meant to connect the dot there to um, knowing it's a problem, knowing that yep. it is your your tendency. Yep. And I think that's where, you know, we look at people, you know, it's, I read a post one time and it was saying like one of the, the funniest things about being around like certain older generations is that they'll like trauma dump out of nowhere with like, <laughs> and not realize they're doing realize it. it. They'll be yep. like, yeah, I remember what my dad used to do, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, Oh yep. God. Oh, grandma. okay. Thanks. Um, but it's one of those things where you can see it on the sleeve as the thing is really helpful. When you, when you grow up seeing that worn on people's sleeves, pastor sleeves and things like that. I think one of the powers now with the conversation, mental health being more commonplace is that we do understand what it is and can identify it when it's happening. So even yep. last night, for example, uh, to maybe put this in a more optimistic way, I realized what was happening. It still took, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get up out of that, yep. but I was able to say to myself, okay, that's not true. I was able to say to myself, your wife's right here. I was able mm-hmm. to say to myself, like, there are people, you know, who are, you have your back and all this stuff, but you have to be able to know that's an issue in order yep. to, to address it in any meaningful way. Yep. And, and also, let me just give your listeners just a, um, a tool real quick. If, uh, if they're like, okay, well, what do I do? What do I do? Like what I actually do, like, I just, I literally just made a, a video about this the other day that when you find yourself, um, or we'll use Eric, when Eric found himself in that situation and he, and he knew that he was spinning about something that was actually irrational. It's actually irrational. Um, to go from what if to what is. Um, Eric was doing like, what if? 
What if no one comes? What if no one knows? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if is really great in the creative brain? If you're doing a project at work, if that's great, what if is great? It is not great <laughs> when your body is like spinning and feeling anxious. So move it to what is like literally like what is, what is this I am seeing like physically? What is this I am, what is this feeling like touch? What am I, what is, what is right in front of me? Um, it takes your brain, it literally switches the way your brain is thinking from like this like grandiose or like this, this negative projecting, to, it brings it back to reality. So the next time that you begin to spin or the one begins to spin or you begin to feel these feelings of anxiousness because of something that we are internally creating, flip your brain, flip the way your brain is thinking from what if to what is, and it slows the anxiety down long enough for you to realize what you're doing and being like, okay, no, I'm, we're, we're not doing this tonight. We're, we're, we're staying here. So that's a, that's a tool that I use. Right. Right. That's, that's super helpful. Um, I, I want to move into kind of helping other people because this is something I talk about advocacy all the time for obvious reasons. That's a big part of, yep. of my life. Um, and, you know, getting to a point where I don't want to say even a place where you're healthy, but a place where you do have that grounded feeling of like, okay, I understand what's making me tick in some way. And there's a lot of people out there that don't, there's a lot of people out there that don't understand that mental health should be a priority the same way their physical yep. health should be. Yep. Um, how do you get to helping other people? Once your oxygen mask is on, how do you start assisting other people and having these conversations in a helpful and healthy way? Yep. It's a great question. It's a great analogy as well. We all need to start thinking a lot more of mental health being like physical health. We all have it. We all have it. We're all, we're all, and, and we're all either working on it or we're not. We're either working on our physical health or we're not. We're either working on our mental health or we're not. And so doing little things to begin to um, improve all our mental wellness is helpful, uh, but specifically uh, about focusing on other people or helping other people. Um, so I used to, I get asked this question a lot, and I used to like give all these things you should look for, and I just stopped because I realized like no one's going to remember. Um, and so what I, what I teach now is that the people, because I think what we're talking about are the people in our, in our sphere, like our close friends, our family, the people that, the people that we are going to be able to have conversations with, not the person at target. Who's, we don't know what, I mean, you know, if, if you want to lean into that, great, but what, go ahead. No, I'm just not, I'm saying, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think, I think that's good to clarify that too, because I think also when I start having this conversation about advocacy and helping other people, people tend to go, I don't have a podcast or I don't have a platform or I don't have <laughs> yeah. like, so I'm glad you clarified your immediate circle. If you have like one friend, you could be an advocate. You, you to got that it. one person. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, These two people. So whoever, whoever the people in your life that you would consider your circle, and this is how I want you to define that. If you know how these humans show up emotionally six days out of the week, those are the people I'm talking about. The people that you know how they enter conversations, the people that you know, sort of kind of their ebbs and flows, like six days out of the week, I'm going to make a bad joke for our current situation. But I chose six days because even the Lord took a day. Okay, so the, the Lord took a day. So like everybody got six days. So and, and here's here's what here's why that's important. The people in your life, if if they start like day two or day three, if like Eric starts showing up differently, if Eric is not um, entering into conversations, if Eric is not adding things to anything we're doing, if Eric is constantly pulling back in a situation, but that's not how Eric shows up. People, we don't need to let Eric go on for two weeks like six days, six days. So after like two or three days, then you can lean in and just say, and I would, I would do it just like this. I'm going to use, I keep using you. I would say, I would begin to say, Hey, Eric, listen, I hope you know how much I care about you. Um, man, I just want you to know that from like the outside friend, it just seems a little different. I'm just going to be honest and say, you seem a little off. Um, is there something happening at home or something happening at work? I would love to support you. Can I listen? Like that's your entire walk up. You lead with care and concern. You own the fact that like from the outside looking in, things just seem a little different. And then you ask them if you can support, not help, because a lot of people don't want help, but support. And then just say, can I listen? And like you're giving, you're giving Eric a free one way to have a conversation. Now, Eric may not, you know, may not lean in and may, he may not talk, um, but, but Eric knows that in the future, if he does need to talk, like I'm here. So I think, I think in life, we are afraid to have conversations to support people because we like, I don't know what to say. Okay. I literally just told you, 
Um, we're like, I don't know when to ask. I literally just told you, like, don't, don't, don't look for all these check boxes. Like, you know how people show up in your life. And when they start showing up differently, lean in and ask questions. And like, not to be dramatic, but to be honest, because you could save someone's life. I mean, the research is very clear that most suicides are preceded by some sorts of signs. But usually the people that can notice them are the people in your inner circle, not the person at Target. Mm -hmm. And so you, you really look for that by looking and see how they show up emotionally when they don't lean in and ask if you can support. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And, and even if, you know, if someone already forgot that because they're like me and they listen to a podcast and go, you know, <laughs> okay, that information's gone. You even do a shorter version of this where you just ask, how yep. are you feeling? How are you feeling? Yep. And, you know, that, and if you tune into your podcast, you'll hear a great musical rendition of that. That'll cement that into your mind forever. <laughs> uh, but, but asking, how are you feeling instead yep. of how are you doing or how is everything or what's up? How are you feeling opens up great conversation. I mean, you've asked me that question and I'm like, oh my God, how am I feeling? <laughs> you know, you start, you start yep. asking yourself these questions. That's a yep. really simple approach. So if you don't remember any of the other steps, you can <laughs> ask somebody today, how are you? How are you feeling? feeling? Yeah. And actually, I actually challenge you all to do it, you know, because yeah. it is fascinating the responses you're going to get back. Mm -hmm. um, but the most common response is going to be feeling, huh? How am I feeling? <laughs> and in that moment, the other person realizes they could name a feeling if you paid them, mm -hmm. but it also then allows you and your friend group. If your friend group starts doing this, promise your friend group, your family will get closer because you're allowing each other to talk about what's really going on inside as opposed to like, I'm fine. Or I, yeah. like, I don't know. Right. I don't know what I means, but right. we sure say it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it makes you go a little bit deeper, you know? Yeah. And, and my response when I would ask people that when you did your challenge, I would ask people, it was always like, what do you mean how I'm feeling? <laughs> I know, right? You know, cause, cause typically when someone says, how are you? I know for me, like I was in the worst like end of 2019, early 2020, I was in the worst place mentally. And people would ask, how are you doing? But like, oh, I just got a raise or I'm making more money or doing this. And it's like very easy to just pass it off to like, oh, this circumstance is good. Mm -hmm. But then it would come into, you know, how are you feeling? It's like, yeah, I'm making more money than ever. And I feel miserable and depressed, you yep. know, like that's a, that's a much more difficult thing to just throw out there, you know? Yep. Um, so yep. I, th I think that's super helpful. Um, yep. Before we close out here, I know we've got like 15 minutes, but I want to talk a little bit about your own brand because um, you're doing this at uh, on a level where you do have a platform. You, you're podcasting, you're doing your um, you're speaking, you're going to different events and talking about this. How did that kind of start, and what's kind of the goal or your mission uh, with your your brand? Yeah. Um, so the first part, it started sort of as an accident, um, which is probably true for a lot of us. You know, I, I've been in higher education for a very long time, many years. And um, because I've been always been so open about my struggle with addiction, um, you know, back in the day, people would say, hey, can you come speak to my group about addiction and recovery, whatever. And so I would. And then one time someone said, what's your rate? And I was like, rate for what? And they were like, to speak. And I was like, uh, a pizza. I don't buy me a pizza. I don't know. Um, I mean, this was like a very long time ago, people, but um, that's how it all started. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay. Because since I used to be a performer, like I've got stage presence for days. So being on a stage in front of thousands of people is actually very comfortable to me. Um, being in a room with one person is actually much more uncomfortable. So like, give me a stage and a mic, I'm good to go. Uh, and so it kind of progressed over time um, to where, you know, I'd always had a job and this speaking thing was my side hustle. Um, and then, as you know, in January of 2020, I thought, let's start a business. And so I left my job as the vice president of health and safety at a company where I was supporting health and safety initiatives for college students all over the country and took a leap. And I believe that the net would not have holes and it did not have holes until March, March of 2020, when the holes began. Um, but what's really fascinating about that time and that experience is that um, I absolutely laid in my bed and felt sorry for myself for two days. I absolutely did. I watched Grey's Anatomy. I had ice cream. I felt sorry for myself. And then I got out of bed and started doing work. Um, and I started like just giving back. I, I learned what I learned in recovery. I just gave back. And I gave, I just did like free program after free. I mean, all these free programs on mental wellness. 
And then what's, what's bizarro to me now is looking back, I've talked to people, they had no idea I was giving away. They thought I was like killing it in the pandemic. And I was like, are you kidding? I got a job at Lowe's because we had to like buy diapers for our two-year-old. Um, but then that sort of just progressed. And, um, and then when, when people's budgets did open up again, I was the first person they called. Um, and so, you know, today my business um, is, is growing rapidly, um, which is great because it's great that more people want to talk about mental wellness. Um, I would say my ultimate goal, um, like I have a big goal that's probably not possible, um, which is I don't want anyone else to, to die from suicide. That's my my big goal. Um, I don't know if that's possible in my lifetime, but I believe that I work, if I work towards that goal, um, that we can save a lot of lives. I just co-founded a tech company that I can't even tell you the name of just yet, but it's coming um, with the, the goal to drastically increase the, the amount of loneliness that happens in the world. Our goal mm -hmm. is to end loneliness uh, because we believe that if loneliness doesn't exist, that it can't kill. Um, so that's the, that's the big goal. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I'm glad to see you exploding um, and, and doing super well, because I, I, like I've said, I, I love your brand. I love hearing you talk about this stuff and it's encouraging to me, like having one-to-one -one conversation, seeing your posts is awesome. Like it really is super helpful. Like, and I'm saying that again for myself, like, even if it's not helpful to anybody else, even doing this episode, you know um, yeah. you know, if, if nobody listens to it, you know, it's a bummer. Uh, but I, for me, I'm like, you're the type of person I like talking to. I like hearing your perspective on this stuff. And uh, I relate to your, uh, your speaking thing when they asked, uh, what's your, what's your fee? Uh, because <laughs> somebody asked me to speak at an event a couple months ago and uh, they said, you know, Hey, we want to have you come uh, speak. The speaker's fee is this. And I was like, crap, they want me to pay to speak. I'd love to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and then they wrote again and they were like, asked me, I was like, Oh, they're paying me they're to paying come speak. <laughs> so, you know, it, but it's funny because you just, you do this stuff for so yep. long. Yep. And again, you tell yourself like, Oh, nobody hears me. Nobody cares. Yep. And then you start realizing like, this is a need everywhere, Everyone especially, yep. especially for you going to college campuses, going to high schools, going to all these different places and sharing. It is so prevalent. These feelings, these issues, yep. they're yep. widespread and, you know, people are, begging for someone to talk about it, even if they yep. won't say so they're wanting someone to be able to post about this, talk about this yep. and share, uh, how they feel about this. Um, what's the best place for people to connect with you? If they want to find out more, if they want to, you know, check into your brand, follow your posts, where's the best place to do that? Yeah, I would say uh, two places. The easiest is just go to the website, um, which is archiecares.com. You can get everything from there. Um, the place that I'm most active is Instagram, which is Archie underscore cares. Um, I think at this point in Instagram, if you just type in Archie cares, you're going to find me. Uh, but the brand is really simple. I, I decided if I was going to start a business that the name of the company was going to mean what I believe in life. And I do care a lot. What's funny is that people now think that's my last name. Like literally someone called me Mr. Cares. And I was like, Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. We can go with that, but not sure. the last name. <laughs> yeah, so um, Archie, archiecares.com is the easiest place to find me. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, if you're listening to this episode, definitely be sure to head over to archiecares.com, head over to Instagram, uh, follow Archie over there. And seriously, if you're listening to this episode, this is one of those guests, like I've known Archie now for a little over a year, I think now. And every time we talk, I feel better than before we talked. So that's a pretty good thing. And uh, same with Instagram, same with, you know, following posts, check out content. Uh, this is my you know, I personally am endorsing this. I, th I think his brand is awesome and I wouldn't have him on the show if I didn't feel that way. But um, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking so openly about all these different issues. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning. It's good to talk to you. A review on iTunes. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.